Everybody. It is great to see you come out. Uh, again, we were expecting to be outside, but just a little chilly today. When I got here this morning, it was a little chilly too <laughs> inside. I wasn't sure which was better inside or outside, but uh, thanks for coming. And uh, I'm just pretty much guessing based on the weather, we're going to be inside from now on. So just, just plan on that. Uh, this Friday and Saturday, we're having a, a cleaning here at the church. Pretty much the whole place needs cleaned. It needs vacuum dusted. The bathrooms need cleaned. So if you can be here anytime, Friday or Saturday, uh, we would appreciate uh, any help. I'll have something on the bulletin board, but basically it's just dust, vacuum, clean, everything. So if you can make it, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. We have a board meeting on Thursday, October 1st at 630. Uh, on October 4th, we're having communion here in the church. And then following the service, we're having a, a congregational meeting. Uh, we have some building options, plans that we'd like to share with the congregation. So Again, the 4th, we have a congregational meeting. I will be on vacation. October 11th, my dad will be preaching. And then on Halloween night, uh, we're going to just hand out treats uh, for anybody who's out on the street. We bought some tracks. We're going to buy some brown paper bags. And we're going to be collecting candy that's wrapped. And then we're going to put them all in bags and just, just give them out to people as they're out on the street. As they drive by or walk by, we're just going to uh, meet people where they're at to get them where Jesus wants to take them. So uh, we're going to start collecting candy. If, if you want to just bring any candy, make sure it's wrapped candy. Uh, because of what's going on today, we want to be very careful. Just bring that in, and then we will let you know when we're going to be packing the bags. Our Wednesday night Bible study, again, has started up on Wednesday night. Let's open up in a word of prayer, please. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity to again gather together in Jesus' name. And thank you for each one who's come out, who has made this time to fellowship with other believers, but to hear from you. So, Father, may we lay aside every weight that is entangling us, any thought that is distracting us, and just let your Spirit move in and through us. And as your Spirit moves, may we respond. Lord, whatever it may be today that you want to do for each one of us individually, we ask that we allow you to do it and that you make us new and afresh in all things. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
trusting him for everything that's going on in our lives or are we just leaning on our own understanding but let's lean on the everlasting arms his arms are a lot stronger than ours his way is a lot better than ours we're going to go to prayer uh, in just a few moments and just remember to pray for our elections there's just a lot going on a lot at stake uh, pray for for donnie as he has surgery on friday uh, we want to be in prayer for that, and then a, a young couple, EJ and Dolly, they're having a very difficult pregnancy, and they're saying the child may have some problems, and the doctors are encouraging them to abort the baby, and uh, she says, as long as there's a heartbeat, we will not do that, and we want to pray for wisdom, and basically, let's pray for healing for this baby. It's only about 20 weeks, but God can do a lot in the next couple months, can he? Let's pray for, for continued strength for the family and healing for this young child. Are there any other announcements or any other, I'm sorry, prayer requests at this time? The baby's liver's not working? Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Did the food get down to Paradise Mountain? Praise the Lord for that. Yeah, Cheryl speaks at the Shiloh meeting in Jason's Who is that? Cheryl Seacrest. Joan Seacrest, knee replacement. Anybody else? Here, let's go to prayer at this time and as I'm up here pray yourself or whatever the Lord lays on your heart again if you'd like to come up front and pray uh, for a very specific need that's very important to you and you just want to really commit it uh, the front is open but let's go to prayer at this time oh Lord our Lord how majestic is your name in all the earth the whole earth is full of your glory Father, may we bring glory and honor to your name as your children. Thank you that you are worthy of praise, that you are in control of all that's going on. The world is just in turmoil and upheaval, but Father, you are in control. Nothing is surprising you, is shocking you, and we just thank you that we can lean on the everlasting arms of Almighty God. Thank you for a great uh, summer of being able to be outside and worship you in, in, in the sunlight and the wind and the one time the rain. Lord, just thank you for that opportunity. Now, as we again start gathering inside, we just ask for, for your uh, wisdom and your touch upon us. Give us give us wisdom in knowing what to do with this pandemic and what we can, can and can't do, should and shouldn't do. And, but Lord, let's not forsake the assembling together, but really come and, and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray for the elections coming up. There, there's so much going on and with the Supreme Court uh, opening right now, just uh, Lord, we just really need to trust you. And we ask for to, to not just say Christian words or say Christian things to Christian people, but then do other things to other people. But Lord, Father, they will just really trust you. And may we be informed and may we know what platform is most biblical for us to support and what we should do and, uh, as, as Christians. So we just ask for your leadership in this whole situation and that you'll lead each one of us in what we should do. We pray for Donnie, Lord. We thank you that he was able to go on vacation and now that they're back and getting ready for the surgery, we just pray for your healing touch upon him. We believe that you can take care of this problem just by your touch, your word, your thought, and, and we pray for his healing, either through your touch or through this surgery. Uh, Father, if he needs a surgery, just give the doctors wisdom and and, and knowing what to do and then Donnie will have a quick recovery and be able to get back doing the things that he wants and needs to do but we just commit him to you we pray for EJ and Dolly Lord if this difficult pregnancy and they're not sure if the baby will survive or not and if the baby survives it has to have surgeries right away just just a lot going on and the the world's saying just just get rid of it throw it away but we pray for EJ and Dolly that you give them wisdom and strength and Thank you for their stance that they will not abort it. And Father, we pray for a miracle that you will heal this, this baby's body, that you will make it whole and well. And again, we just commit this situation to you. We pray for salvation for EJ and Dolly, Lord, that 
Lord, we thank you for their conviction against abortion, but now we pray for their salvation also, that their hearts will be changed, that they'll become new creations in you. Think of Autumn, who's having uh, this, this baby whose liver is not working. Uh, we pray for uh, the parents as they, they wrestle and struggle with why and see their little baby hurting and struggling. So we just ask that you give them peace and patience. And Lord, if they don't know you, they'll again come to an understanding of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But for this little baby, Father, we pray for for her liver, that you'll just touch it and make it well. Or if there's a way, Lord, that they can help it to go or a transplant, whatever it needs to be, Lord, we just commit this situation to you. We ask that you bring glory and honor to your name through this situation. And as we pray, Lord, that you will bring about great things. Pray for the lady with the knee replacement tomorrow, Lord. We just ask that you uh, work in this situation again. Just a lot of inconveniences. And we pray for a quick recovery, that be able to get back on their feet, and again, just do the things that they want and need to do. Father, again, thank you for the service where we can gather together in Jesus' name, where we can worship you. And Father, just totally take control of all that we say and do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If we're able, let's stand together as we sing Living Hope. In January, uh, Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The body began to bleed out of the silence, the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me 
salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Amen. You may be seated. He is our living hope. He died, yes. But he is alive and he's seated at the right hand of God. And someday when the trumpet's on, he's coming to take us home. He's our living hope for heaven. He's our living hope for now to make it through the days and the age in which we live. Again, in Ephesians chapter 4, we're moving from theology, from study to practice. We're going from doctrine, knowing, to doing, duty. From creed to conduct. From the Christian's wealth to their walk. Okay, we've been going through the first three chapters. Now we know what to believe. Now we need to do it. Knowing and doing are two different things. Prove what we believe. Faith without works is dead. We are calling Ephesians 4 to live a life worthy of our calling. Our calling is to have a relationship with God, through Jesus Christ, to be children of God, and we are to live a life worthy of that calling and make every effort to keep unity in the Spirit through the bond of peace. Are we living a life worthy of our calling? Are we trying to create unity in the family of God? Now, to create unity doesn't mean, well, I'm just a peacemaker, so I'm not going to say anything or do anything. I'm just going to sit back and accept whatever happens. That's not what we're talking about. That means we're moving ahead, but as we move ahead, we have disagreements. We work together to find out what is right for the corporate body, and then we work to keep unity within, though we have differences. And it all is to glorify God. Now we're in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. God has given every sincere believer his grace and gifts and his mercy and all this as a means to living how we are supposed to live. So many times we want to live a certain way and we just can't because we don't have what we need to live that way. Well, God has given us everything that we need to live according to how he wants us to live. And he has in his gospel made generous provision for us to walk worthy of our calling, of our vocation. Again, God has done this for us. He has given it to us so that if we partake of it, taste and see that the Lord is good, and we act out our faith, we will accomplish great things for God. But it's one thing to be given something. It's another thing to accept it and make it a part of our lives. How many times has somebody given you a gift... And you really didn't open it at first, and then when you opened it, ooh, okay, and you put it aside, and that was it. Maybe you re-gifted it and even gave it to somebody else, because it just didn't mean nothing to you. The person was very sincere when they gave me the gift, but we didn't make it a part of our lives. We just kind of got rid of it. Many people, God has offered them the gift of salvation, and they, they think in their minds they've tried it because they've done a few certain things, but they've never really made it a part of their lives. They've kind of put it on the shelf. God has given each one of us grace, and grace here means the ability to perform the task God has called us to do. God has called us to have a personal relationship with him, to walk with him, to serve him, serving grace. And all of us at salvation have been given it. We have a special part to perform. Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. So God has given each one of us grace as he apportioned it, as he decides to give it. We don't all have the same grace or the same amount of grace because we don't need it. 
Some of us, with what we're going through, we need saving grace. Some of us need sustaining grace. Some of us need healing grace. There's different things that, but God gives us what we need when we need it. Otherwise, we just would waste it. So God, as he apportions it through Jesus Christ in his spirit, so that we can do what we need to do and live a life of holiness. It is a gift. It is bestowed upon us. It is in a certain measure. Again, it's not specific. We all have been given grace, but different graces to meet what is going on in our lives. And the measure is the gift of Christ and what is given in Christ through him. He's purchased it. So God gives us what we need to make it through what we're going through right now. And then tomorrow, he'll give us what we need to make it through what we're going through tomorrow. So the Bible says, why worry about tomorrow when God's given us what we need for today? You know, it's like the Israelites, they could only take enough man and quail for that day. If they took too much, it would spoil. God says, why don't you just rely on me today? And then when we wake up tomorrow, rely on me tomorrow, and he's going to provide for us. God, by his grace, has apportioned what we need. Verse 8, that is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. This is from Psalm 68, 18. David prophesied, predicted the ascensions of Christ, and Paul kind of borrows it here. This is why it says, in order to remind us that Christ, the head of the church, is the author of all these different gifts. And that given of them is an act of his grace. This is why it is said, when he ascended on high, when Christ ascended up on high after his death into heaven, in his glorified, elevated state, better than his human state, he ascended. He, yes, he came down, and we'll talk about that in the next verse. But he went back up after he had accomplished the task that God had asked him to accomplish. And when he ascended, he led captives in his train. He conquered those who conquered us. Sin and death and the grave and the devil, those, the ones that overcome us, God captured them. God put them to death for our spiritual lives so that we don't have to obey them. And when he ascended, he became Lord of all and he was handed the keys over sin and death. In Hades. He led captives in his train. Colossians 2.15 says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross, and gave gifts to men. As a conqueror distributes in token of his triumph the spoils of foes as gifts among the people, God gives us gifts so that we can overcome the enemy. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now we ourselves are not very powerful. The appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He came to earth, he took on our form, he paid the price for our sin and death. He actually became sin for us. So he descended from heaven, took on our form, to die for us, to reach us, so God could welcome us into his family. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He went from the lowest state of humiliation and then was exalted to the highest place. He's worthy of our acceptance. He's worthy of our obedience. He has done all this for us. And it's not, the gospel message is not just do okay and attend church, we're all going to go to heaven in the end, so it doesn't matter. No. The gospel is Jesus Christ came to earth. He lived among us, yet without sin, died for us, paid the price, and on the third day was raised again, and now seated at the right hand of God. That's the gospel message. That's what we have to accept. That's what we have to live. So he 
ascended, but he also descended. And then verse 10, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. This same Redeemer in Acts, the angel said to the apostles, why are you looking up to heaven? This same Jesus, not somebody else, not a substitute, not a temp, this same Jesus who walked on earth, who died, is the same one who's going to come back. You know, you see all these TV shows and these murder mysteries where there's twins, you know, and you don't know which one you're dealing with and all this kind of stuff. There's only one Jesus. And it's this same Jesus whom we serve. In order to fill the whole universe, that he might fill all things, all the members of his church with gifts and graces, that he might fill all things by his influence and direct and overrule all by wisdom, and power. Do we give God control? Again, you know, when those little GPS things first came out, you know, most of us had them in our car. You'd plug them in and you would plug it. And, you know, many times I kind of knew where I was going, but it would tell me to turn and I didn't want to turn. So I kept going and then it would say, recalculating. And then it would pick up from where I was. Then it would say, turn in 500 feet. Well, that would take me back to that. I want to keep going. So I'd keep going. Then it would say, recalculating. And I got to where I wanted to be. Well, guess what? We don't do that with Jesus. When God says do it, we do it because there's no recalculating. It's his way or it's not. We're either for Jesus or we're against Jesus. There's no recalculating. Yes, there's forgiveness of sins. But we can't do it our way to get to heaven. We have to do it his way. He wants us to be obedient to him. He gives abundant gifts and graces to his church and gives his people power to use them. The gifts and the enabling grace we have been, have been given to us by Christ. But they're given with great expectation on his part. He gives because he wants us to use them. Do we understand that? God does not just give us his gifts and graces so we're comfortable. He gives us his grace and his gifts so that we use them to draw closer to him and to further his kingdom and build the church up. Do we understand that? It's not just for our comfort that he gives us these things. It is to do battle against the enemy and stand up for the kingdom of God. The church needs to be revived in America today. We've been quiet. We've been stagnant too long. It's time to let people know who our Jesus is and not be ashamed of him. Power and victory for the church. Through what God has given us. Now as we continue in this chapter. Paul now focuses on four offices. Given to the church with the gifts. To fulfill these offices. And these offices are given. To the, for the expansion. And building up of the church. Again what does that mean? To bring people to Christ. To raise them up in Christ. And to send them out for Christ. God has given us gifts and abilities and offices within the church to build up the church. So that we get so excited about our relationship, we just got to tell other people, and then they become born again, and then they become part of our church, and we disciple them, and they get built up, and then they start telling people, and it just continues to go and grow for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. So verse 11 it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Some to be apostles. These are those who were immediately called by Christ. They saw the crucifixion. They were able to do miracles. And God gave them very extraordinary gifts so that they could start the church. They went around and, and started the church and they were kind of governing over the churches because they were with Christ, the 12 apostles. They wanted to plant and govern and start churches 
with witnesses and miracles and doctors. He, doctrine. He sent them forth. They were on the ground floor of the beginning of the church in the book of Acts. And some to be prophets. Now in the Old Testament, we had prophets that would foretell. They told what was going to take place. Well, in the New Testament, there wasn't new things that were going to happen. So they would, these prophets would explain the Old Testament and explain what has taken place as fort, that was foretelling. Is that, is that the right word? Foretelling and foretelling. One is before and one they're explaining afterwards. So the prophets of the New Testament were different than the prophets of the Old Testament because the prophets of the Old Testament spoke for God because there was no Bible. And they explained what God was going to do. And then in the New Testament, they explained what God had already done to give them understanding. Some to be evangelists, gifted in preaching the gospel and bringing people to Christ. They make the message of the gospel plain and relevant to the lost. These would be uh, people that would travel. They wouldn't be, most of them wouldn't be pastors of one church, but they would travel. And they were very gifted in explaining to the lost about Jesus Christ and God really gifted them with bringing people to Jesus Christ. I mean, you think of Billy Graham. I'm sure all of us have heard his sermons. Very basic, very simple. But boy, did people respond, didn't they? And it wasn't because of Billy. But God had gifted him as an evangelist to bring people to Jesus Christ. He was an evangelist. So these people were very gifted in bringing people to Jesus Christ. Then some to be pastors. The shepherd of the flock shares the word of God to change lives. A tender, caring, nurturing touch. A gentle prod at the right time. But also a pastor has to have strength to protect the flock and be able to say no when it needs to be no. But, but a pastor is more of a shepherd. Yes, they need to preach the word of God very plainly, but but he needs to take care of the flock in, in this office. And preaching the word of God is the single greatest need of the church universal today. We have watered down the gospel. And when we water down the gospel, we had watered down Christians. When we don't preach the whole truth, we have half-truth Christians, if we can even call them that. And then we have teachers, those who share information on doctrine for growth. Uh, more, uh, uh, my understanding is preaching more is to you, you, you proclaim God's word to change lives. Teaching is more of giving information to better understand things and to, to help us that way. Now, again, you can go both ways with that. But we have the offices of apostles and prophets, and many believe they're not around today. But we do have evangelists and preachers and teachers today. And they are given to the church to build up the church. And if the church is going to grow in the Lord, the leaders of the church must preach and teach the foundational truths of the Old and the New Testament. The whole gospel must be preached. We can't just, well, let's, sure, let's shy away from now. I don't know if I totally agree with that. If God says it, we need to believe it. We need to preach it. Even if it, maybe it's not something we like, or maybe it's something that's going to convict us. Boy, don't we hate sermons that convict us? Don't we just want to go to church and be comfortable and leave and say, boy, I really enjoyed that? I don't know about you, I want God to convict us. Because then we're going to be happier when we're doing what he wants us to, rather than just be comfortable. If we're living in sin and comfortable, we need to be careful. So, the leaders must preach and teach, but then those who receive the preaching and teaching must listen, take it to heart, and put it into action. He's given us these offices. And verse 12 tells us why. To prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Given us apostles and prophets and evangelists preachers and teachers to share God's word. Why? So the body of Christ does their job. Well, that takes all the pressure off of me, don't it? I don't have to do everything. My job 
and the leaders of the church and teachers are to prepare us to work together. To go out for Jesus Christ and to witness. To tell others about Jesus. To prepare God's people as restoring of everything to its place. Putting it into order, making it complete. The various offices of the church are appointed in order that everything in the church might be well approved or in its proper place or be complete, as I just said earlier. It is that Christians may have every possible advantage for becoming complete in love and knowledge and order. Yes, we can study the Bible at home, and we should. Yes, we can pray at home, and we should. But there's something about coming together for corporate worship with brothers and sisters in Christ and church family to encourage us to build us up. I was reading through my, one of my books or a devotional this week, and again, if, if you start a fire and you only have one log, the log goes out relatively quickly, doesn't it? But if there's other logs put upon it, the fire gets bigger and bigger, doesn't it? God has called the church to equip his people to burn, to catch fire, to be his witnesses, and then they build up the church. Sheep reproduce sheep. The shepherd leads them. It's important that we do our job. We need to prepare you for that but for the leaders and teachers and preachers to prepare for that, you got to be here. Now, I'm not saying, again, I'm, if, you, if you don't come every week, I'm not trying to put you down. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. God has ordained this for a reason. And I don't know, I figure if you're going to pay me, you might as well come and listen to me. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you, you want something for your money, don't you? I, maybe I'm wrong, but, but that's just my thought. So a neat illustration in, in one of my commentaries. It said, the church is not a bus where the pastor does the driving and the body are the passengers slumbering in peaceful security behind them. You know, when you go on a bus trip, if you've ever been on one, normally you don't look at the route, you just sit in the back and you start talking or you fall asleep or you do a crossword puzzle and when you get to the destination you get off, you don't care, right? The bus driver knows. That's not what the church is. Where the pastor does everything and we just sit back and we're going to go to heaven so we can fall asleep and it doesn't matter. No, the Bible says that these offices train the body for service to be obedient, to grow personally, but then to go and make a difference in the world. The biblical model is the body of Christ in which the leaders prepare God's people for works of ministry. Every one of us has a responsibility to grow up in the Lord and to go out for the Lord. We are called to be His witnesses. Not just support missionaries who witness, but to be witnesses ourselves. Do we understand that? We have a job. Each and every one of us have a job to serve the body of Christ, to reach the unsaved with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, God isn't looking for all of us to be Billy Graham's, but he is looking for us to do the best with what he's given us and use it for his honor and his glory. God, what gift and ability have you given me and how can I use it for your kingdom? God, give me understanding of the gospel message so that I can share it with someone else. Is it easy? No. Do we get rejected? Sure. But the more we do it, the easier it becomes. And the more we believe it, the more we will do it because we feel it's important to us. How important is it to us 
to reach our friends, our neighbors, maybe someone who sits next to us in the church with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why does everybody have a job? So that the body may be built up. The leaders doing their job in the congregation responding to doing their job. What does that build up? Maturity. There is spiritual maturity within the family of God. Now, I know all of us know people who are just immature. And sometimes you're afraid to be with them because you don't know what they're going to say or do. So you've got to protect those who are around you. So certain people are not going to, because you know, you just, so, just grow up. Now, I'm not talking about a two year old, I'm talking about a man or a woman, you know. How can you be this way? Why do you act that way? You should know better. You shouldn't say stuff like that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Well, how many people who call themselves Christians are very immature because they're not doing the works of the service? They're not using their gifts to glorify God. And they're just jumping all over the place and they really have no idea what they're doing. And they're not finding fulfillment and joy in their relationship with God because there is no maturity. Everyone who walks worthy of their calling will become edified, built up, mature. And as we do that and minister to others, as we do our works of the service, we will bring people to Jesus Christ and we will encourage other believers to grow up in Christ. Let's make the team better. Again, if you play an instrument and you were really good at it, or if you played sports and you were really good at it, or you were in school really good at it, and there were people that weren't quite as good as you when you were on the same team, what did you do? You tried to make them better, didn't you? Because you want the team to be better. But how about we do that with the family of God? Why don't we encourage each one of us to be better? Better Christians. More obedient. That we call sin, sin. And that we encourage each other to confess our sins and then to walk in that newness of life and to become mature in Him. As we grow in our faith and our obedience, we will grow up. Let's not just become lazy in our walk with God. May we not be easily swayed by the latest fad or teaching, but as we talked about earlier, may we be grounded, rooted, and established in the truth of God's Word. What does God say? What will I do? And why do we do this? Why do we become mature? Until verse 13, we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Until we reach, till all Christians arrive at a state encouraged in this verse of what? Unity in the faith. Till we hold the same truths. Till we have the same confidence in God. Yeah, we're all going to have different levels of faith, but, but aren't we all growing and walking together? And then when each one of us are strong in a certain area, we grab others and bring them up. And when we're weak, somebody grabs us and picks us up. There's no judgment. There's no condemning. There's loving as we walk together. There's unity in the family of God. John 17, 23 says, I am them and you and me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. The more united we are, the more the world will see Christ in us. If we call ourselves Christians and we're bickering and fighting and disagreeing, boy, that's inviting. I want to join that group, don't you? A lot better stay in bed on Sunday than to join a group that's bickering. I can bicker during the week at work. I can disagree with people at work. Unity. Agree on spiritual things. And in the knowledge of the Son of God, that we each might attain the same practical, practicing friendship with the Son of God. And that through that friendship we might become mature in Christian godliness, righteousness, 
and goodness. So as we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, the next part says, and we become mature. Be a full grown adult, not a child. Let's strive to be perfect. And we're not going to obtain spiritual perfection this side of heaven. But that doesn't mean we don't try. Let's not quit because we can't be perfect. But let's strive to be perfect. Let's strive to be holy. Why? Because he is holy. And he's given us everything we need to be holy if we just trust and obey. He wants us to have a state of strength, energy, wisdom. He wants us to realize what we have and attain to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. Grow spiritually to become holy like Christ. Strive to be filled with the Holy Spirit to be holy in Christ. And sold out to take the message for Christ. May we strive to be completely conformed to his will and to his way. Understand we will fall, but let's not just accept that, okay, I'm going to fall, big deal. No, let's strive not to. And when we do, we feel guilty and we confess it and we try to go and get back on the right path. We want unity. We want maturity. We want to know more about God so that we have the whole measure of the fullness of Christ living in us. For when we do this, verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful schemings. If we are mature, if we're serving Christ, if we are rooted and established, we're not going to be tossed about like a baby. And my little grandson, a couple months old, boy, his head's like a, a bobblehead. You know, I was like, dude, what are you doing? You know, I'm trying to hold him so he's not. He's just tossed about by every little thing, and if we don't hold him, he's just flopping. That's the way many believers are. Oh, this wind of teaching. Oh, I'm blown over by that. Oh, what about this? Oh, I don't know about, you know, we don't know what the truth is. We're not rooted and established. So when all these false teachings blow, then, yeah, I ain't moving. I'm grounded in a solid rock of Jesus Christ and his truth. I'm standing upon the promise of God. I will not be moved. But too many people who call themselves Christian are just blown here. Well, I'm not sure. Maybe that's good teaching. Oh, but what about this? Oh, I got to do this, you know. Let's know what the Bible says so that we're not like infants tossed back and forth, blown here and there. Yes, we need to start like babies in our faith. We're not going to be born full-grown adults. But let's not remain babies. Let's grow up. To grow up, we need to study. We need to pray. We need to fellowship. Come to church where we are, Lord willing, fed and encouraged by our brothers and sisters in Christ. People of the world will try to distort the truth and pull us away. But as we are rooted and established and we are part of a fellowship that encourages us, we will not be moved. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 says, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Be mature. Not tossed about. Not accepting sin in our lives. I'm just going to do it my way. God's a God of love, so I don't care. He's going to let me sin and do whatever I want. No. God, I want to be like you. I want to be different. I want the people to see Christ living in me. That I am different, that I'm not conformed. Yes, I'm in this world, but I'm not doing what the world says. What is right, I will do. What is wrong, I will not do. That needs to be our motivation because Christ is in us. Let's not be tossed about. Let's be grounded and founded in him. Very quickly, verse 15. Instead of being flopped and tossed about, rather, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is Christ. Rather than being tossed about following false ideologies, how about we speak, again, action, it's not just thinking, sitting back, doing nothing, but speak the truth, he is the way, the truth, and the life, the gospel message in love to other people. 
You know, it's so easy to condemn people when we, when, we, when we see what they're doing wrong. When I played college basketball, we used to, it was at a Christian school, and we used to go around to, in the locker room after a practice or before a game just to kind of get team unity. And we had to tell what we liked about the person to our right. And, and we'd go around. And sometimes that took a while. Boy, what do I like about this guy? But then sometimes we went what we didn't like about the person. That was like a ceiling fan. <laughs> it was so easy. Oh boy, I do everything I don't like about you. But how about we take time to see the good and not just always condemn the bad. Let God take care of the bad. Let's talk about the truth in love. Let's love one another as he first loved us in the family. And then let's love our enemies. Those who are against God are our enemies and we need to bring them in as family. Our enemies don't have to stay enemies. They can become family. Well, there's other ways to speak the truth. Oh, we can pound it. We can be harsh. We can be judgmental. But no, it says in love speak the truth of who Jesus is. We need to hurt that their souls are going to hell and we need to love them to Jesus Christ. For when we speak the truth in love, all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Grow into Christ. The stature of the complete person and through him, he is the head, all flows through him. Surrender all to him, submit to his authority. Acknowledge him in all things, dependent upon him. If we're not connected to the head, there's no life. Yes, if you cut a chicken's head off, it'll run around a while. It's kind of comical, but then it dies. We cannot live without being attached to the head of our faith, Son of God, who died to take away the sins of the world. For from him the whole body, verse 16 joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. He holds everything together, supports every aspect of our spiritual lives, and he builds us up in love as each part does its work. As we, each one of us, do our jobs within the body, the church will be built. It will be built up from the inside out, we will reach people for Jesus Christ because we're reaching each other in love. We're supporting one another. We're able to confess our sins with one another because we're not going to judge you. We're going to love you and we're going to try to get you to change from that sin, but we're not going to condemn you in it. We're going to love you to Jesus Christ. Love you to, love you to life rather than love you to death. We're going to love you to life in Christ. The church growth is advanced by the loving cooperation of all its members by their vital union with Christ. Unity and maturity represent the qualities and the distinctions of Christ as the head. Dear friends, we need to ask ourselves, what am I doing with Christ in my life and what am I doing for Christ in my life? It's easy to become complacent. It's easy to call ourselves a Christian and then basically do absolutely nothing. Oh, we may read the Bible once in a while. We may pray, yeah. We, we do those things so that we feel better, but are we making a difference in the world? If we have a job and we're not fulfilling our duties at work, we're probably not going to have a job for long, are we? We have to fulfill what has been asked of us to fulfill at work. Well, how about we start fulfilling what God has asked us to fulfill in the family of God? Do we want the church to be built up and to grow? Let's do our job. And let's go into the world and live and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. The essential for church growth, spiritual gift of leadership. The means of church growth, discipleship, the process of making one become like Christ. The goal of growth, maturity. The method of growth, 
truthing in love. We sang leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's lean on him as we are doing our job, not just lean on him to be lazy. Why? He is our living hope. As he is alive, he wants to make us alive in him to fulfill our calling and to bring unity in the family of God and to share Christ to a lost and dying world. And then we're going to sing in a few moments 10,000 reasons. There's 10,000 reasons to serve him, to love him, to share the precious name of Jesus with others. Who is Jesus to us? What are we doing with Jesus in us? And what are we doing for Jesus, for others? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for each one of us come out today and give this time to you. And Father, may this time be well spent in hearing from you, causing us to be obedient to you and service in service for you. Speak to us, Father, in the remaining moments of this service. Let us not leave if we're not right with you. Let us not leave if we have something that's hindering us or stopping us from really growing up in you. Speak to us. Lead us. Guide us. And may we respond to your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song, 10,000 Reasons. If God's been speaking to you today, again, you come and kneel at the front. You can sit in the front pews. We'd love to pray with you. If, if God is just speaking to you, please respond to him and listen to his voice. Let's stand together as we sing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name.
time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then for